unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. When I tell people that nowhere in the Bible does it say, repent of your sins to be saved, they might try and challenge me with Luke chapter 13 where it says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, and Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus goes on to say, All those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think you that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now normally this would be the part of the video where I point out something like, it doesn't actually say, of your sins. But rather like the previous video, where we looked at the joy in heaven over the sinner that repents. Sinners are the people who are told to repent in this passage. But as we saw in that video, the issue isn't who needs to repent. Okay, We know that sinners need to repent, but the issue is how sinners repent. Now, we have already seen how sinners repent in Luke 5, 15 and 16 in previous videos that I've done. Jesus, the good physician, heals them. Jesus, the good shepherd, finds them. The father sees the son from afar off and has compassion on him. They are persuaded to acknowledge the truth. So we already have that concept from those passages anyway, but this passage is a little different than those because we don't know exactly who Jesus was talking to in this passage. Was it Pharisees? Was it Jews? Was it Gentiles? We're not really sure. Other than that, they, whoever they were, asked him about some Galileans who met an unexpected end. We don't know exactly why they asked this question, or exactly what false presuppositions Jesus needed to refute. Therefore, only Jesus' reply to the question gives us any indication why they were asking, and can determine any assumptions we can make about the false presuppositions that the inquirers had. Once we cross-examine Jesus' reply, we see that it is not rebellious sinners who need to repent of their sins to avoid perishing. Rather, it is the people who tell you that you need to repent of your sins for salvation that actually need to repent of their false presuppositions, otherwise they will likewise perish. We will see and demonstrate this. In verse 1, the inquirers are asking Jesus about some Galileans who Pilate had presumably killed, possibly in a very horrific and unpleasant manner, and used their blood for sacrifices, which possibly brought shame or disgrace on them and their families post-mortem. So we see this is a very unpleasant way to die, it's a very unfortunate end. Jesus then says to them, in layman's terms if you like, they were not any more sinful or more deserving of this kind of death than all or any other Galileans that did not suffer such thing, including any that had a much more preferable death, let's say the ones that died peacefully in old age or something like that. Jesus then points to another unfortunate incident which he was not asked about, but his recipients must have been aware of it, and essentially says the same thing about people living in another city, that the men on whom the Tower of Siloam fell were not any more deserving of their unfitting end than anybody else that dwelt in Jerusalem. Joining the dots, we can assume that the Jerusalemites were not any more or less sinful than the Galileans. Being the holy city of the temple doesn't make them superior in the sight of God than the region of which it was said that no prophet arises, or that the town which it was asked can any good thing come from Nazareth, because Nazareth was in Galilee. Jesus obviously responds to his own rhetorical questions, and the answer is obviously no. The people who suffered these unfortunate incidents were not any more deserving of this than anybody else who dwelt in their city, and neither one city was more or less deserving of it than the other city. Given that Jesus explained this to them, it is highly likely that the people asking this question had the presupposition that because they themselves had not suffered such things, they were either less sinful than those who did, or not sinful at all. They assumed that sinners suffer these terrible catastrophes, and righteous people do not. There are various Old Testament scriptures they could use to justify this. For example, Ezekiel chapters 4, 8 and 33. So Jesus then obviously says to them, Repent, or you shall all likewise perish. Even basic observation shows that there are many sinful, wicked people who do not meet an unexpected end with these horrible tragedies. So obviously most Christians will make the logical leap that Jesus means perish in eternity, not merely perishing physically. This is a reasonable view to take, because otherwise Jesus' words would be of little weight. Hell is likewise an unexpected and very, very unpleasant end. So given that these people needed to repent, what did they need to repent of? A fair assessment of Jesus' answer leads us to conclude that they needed to repent 
of thinking that they themselves were either at most not sinners, or at least significantly less sinful than the people who suffered these tragedies. When you see it this way, you realise that this pretty much describes the repent of your sins false prophets to a T, and the attitude that they have towards the saints that are actually saved by grace, you know, because the Good Shepherd actually found us and the father saw us afar off and had compassion on us. They love to boast about how they used to be so sinful, but then they repented and stopped sinning, and they live a clean life, surrendered totally to the Lord. But you wicked grace abusers, you will suffer the same fate as the Galileans and the victims of Siloam, because you are just such filthy wicked sinners. Or they love to exalt themselves by railing at people in the streets who usually aren't interested in the gospel anyway, winding them up and harassing them to provoke reaction, then call them filthy wicked sinners in their video titles for reacting against such a loving man of God. So the people that tell you to turn from your sins to be saved are precisely the very same people who Jesus is warning here that unless they also repent, they shall all likewise perish. They will not escape the judgment of God just because they love to boast about how repentant and righteous they are since they surrendered their life but everybody else are filthy, wicked sinners. So how do sinners repent and escape the judgment of God then? Well, we already answered this in videos 7 and 8, when we looked at calling sinners to repentance and the joy over one sinner that repents. We can observe that Jesus, the good physician, heals them. Jesus, the good shepherd, finds them. The father sees the son from afar off and has compassion on him. They are persuaded to acknowledge the truth. But perhaps this doesn't give us a practical instruction. So what is the practical answer? Just as the word perish can be interpreted to mean damnation in this passage, and the antithesis to eternal life, we can also summon another verse where perish is used in exactly the same way. For example, in John 3.16, that much-loved famous verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is what biblical repentance for salvation means. And notice that it says God loved you for salvation. You didn't love God, just like the prodigal son and good shepherd that we saw in the previous video. So in conclusion, you don't get saved by repenting of all of your sins. The people that teach that you need to repent of your sins to be saved are the ones that need to repent, according to Luke 13. They need to repent of thinking that they're better than you because you're a filthy sinner like those Galileans who met that unfortunate end and they're not. Now, if someone wants to disagree with me and say, well, I think they needed to repent of their sins. Well, then the question that I would have to ask you about the group of people that Jesus is talking to here, what sins did they have to repent of? Were they smokers? Were they hanging around with too many prostitutes? Were they murderers? Were they thieves? What sins did they need to repent of? Now, some will say, well, they needed to repent of all of them. Well, the same question applies. What sins did they need to repent of? Nothing in this passage tells us that the people that Jesus was speaking to were very, very sinful. And if they were asking this question, it implies that they thought that they weren't sinful. Repenting of sin only makes you a repentant sinner, but you're still a sinner. You're just a repentant one. Only by being washed freely in the blood of Christ can you become not a sinner. That's what biblical repentance for salvation is. And I've done more than enough videos on this issue now to demonstrate this to you without any controversy or doubt whatsoever. This is no-nonsense Christianity reminding you that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins to be saved.